Introducing our program and leading our discussion is David Kreutzer, Dr. Kreutzer's Senior Research Fellow in Energy, Economics, and Climate Change in our Center for Data Analysis. He researches how energy and climate change legislation will affect economic activity at the national, local, and industry levels. He's, his research has been published in journals such as the Journal on Political Economy, the National Tax Journal, Economic Inquiry, the Southern Economic Journal, and the Journal of Energy and Development. He has also written numerous mainstream newspaper and media articles. And before joining us here, he was an economist at Bierman and Company. Before that, he taught economics at James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Please join me in welcoming David Kreutzer. David? Well, I want to thank all of you that are here today. I see a lot of familiar faces and some that I haven't seen. And uh, appreciate your coming to listen and, and participate uh, respectfully, of course. And thank those of you that are joining us online. We usually have about as many joining online or sometimes more than we have actually in the auditorium. So when we get to the question and answer part, you'll be asked to state your name and so on in a microphone, even though everybody in the room can hear you without it so that the people online can hear you. <coughs> Today our program is on divestment, okay, movement at universities uh, most notably to expunge from their uh, endowments any uh, stocks that are related to fossil fuels. Um, the movement is clownish in its hypocrisy and stunning in its level of economic ignorance but deadly serious in its impact uh, on universities, its ability to deceive and mislead. Um, we have three great panelists here today, so I'm not going to take much more time other than to introduce them individually to tell you about divestment. They're going to do a great job of it. Starting the program, I'm going to introduce all three, and, and so there won't be any gaps uh, in, in the presentations, is Rachel, excuse me, Rochelle Peterson. She is the Director of Research Projects at the National Association of Scholars. She joined the National Association of Scholars in 2013 as a research associate analyzing the campus sustainability movement and has written extensively on, divest on the divestment movement as well. Ms. Peterson graduated from the King's College in May 2013 with a bachelor's degree in politics, philosophy, and economics. Following her will be Brendan Williams. He is the Executive Vice President of AFPM, the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers, whose members provide the energy and feedstocks for pretty much everything that raises us above the level of the caveman. And ironically, they provide the feedstocks for the plastics and carbon fiber that go into the kayaks that the activists use to oppose the development of the petroleum that becomes the feedstocks that goes into their, you get, it's like the Mobius strip of stupidity. You just keep going <laughs> around and around. <coughs> and similarly, they provide the jet fuel for the Hollywood actors to put in their private jets to go and protest the development of the petroleum that becomes the jet fuel and so on. He is responsible for leading AFPM's government relations, communications, regulatory affairs, petrochemical and outreach departments. He has been with the association since 2007. In 2011, Washingtonian Magazine named Mr. Williams one of DC's top 40 lobbyists under the age of 40. I just missed that last year, but <laughs> anyway. Um, <clears throat> Before joining AFPM, Mr. Williams spent over seven years on Capitol Hill. Recently, most recently, he served as legislative director to Congressman Vito Fasella, where he specialized in energy and environment. Prior to working for Congressman Fasella, Mr. Williams spent three years as a staff member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Mr. Williams attended Syracuse University, where he received a dual degree in broadcast journalism and political science. He also received an MBA from George Mason University. And wrapping up the program will be Stanley Kurtz. He is senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. For the past 15 years, on issues ranging from education to foreign policy to the history of the American left, he has been a leading participant in our national debates. He is a contributing editor at National Review Online and a frequent contributor to many other journals of policy and opinion. A best-selling author, he has written two books on the political history and policy programs of President Barack Obama. They are Radical in Chief, 
the untold story of Barack Obama and American socialism, and spreading the wealth, how Obama is robbing the suburbs to pay for the cities. Mr. Kurtz, or Dr. Kurtz, holds a doctorate degree in social anthropology from Harvard University, and he has won several teaching awards at Harvard and at the University of Chicago. Please give a, a, a welcome applause for everybody, and then we will start with Rochelle. Do you want to sit here or come up? Thank you all so much for being here today. I am the author of a new study on the fossil fuel divestment movement called Inside Divestment. Uh, there are some summary booklets of that available outdoors. Um, they'll be out there when you leave as well if you haven't had a chance to grab one. If you'd like a full copy of the report, I have a couple of copies with me and you can see me afterwards if you're interested in that. Um, the divestment movement um, has succeeded in projecting an image of itself as the movement of an entire generation. And Inside Divestment is the first comprehensive look at what that movement actually looks like. This is a sequel to a study that the National Association of Scholars did in March of this year called Sustainability, Higher Education's New Fundamentalism, where we examined the concept of sustainability, a term that comes to us from the UN in a 1987 report called Our Common Future, and really came to the United States first by way of the college campus uh, in 1990 at John Kerry and Teresa Hines before they were a couple. Um, came back from the Rio Earth Summit and decided the best way to bring the idea of sustainability to the United States would be to get the college presidents to sign the president's climate commitment whereby they would pledge to integrate the idea of sustainability throughout the curriculum and to pledge to make their campuses carbon neutral. Uh, that pledge has since been signed by about 700 uh, college presidents and the fossil fuel divestment movement, which has just emerged in the last few years, is the cutting edge of the sustainability movement. It's the hard, radical front meant to make uh, measures like banning plastic water bottles or installing expensive solar panels on campuses look sensible and moderate. But the fossil fuel divestment movement is spurious and is false on a number of fronts. And I'd like to outline a few of those for you, drawing on the findings of this new report. First of all, the fossil fuel divestment movement claims that it is unleashing free speech from the chains of corporate interest that have uh, kept it uh, locked up on campus. Uh, but instead, the divestment movement actually muzzles free speech. Um, it, its corruption of free speech is so thorough that the movement has uh, pretty well succeeded in hijacking the terms of academic freedom and free speech and turning them into covers for uh, political activism. And to explain this, let me give you a, a very brief history of this movement. Uh, in August 2012, Bill McKibben, the environmental activist, wrote an article in Rolling Stone that went viral. His article was called Global Warming's Terrifying New Math. And the terrifying new math, he said, was that in order to stop temperatures from increasing more than two degrees Celsius, it was necessary to leave 80% of all fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, he said uh, there was no way governments would agree to do this, even though he believed the American public would like to do this. And so the fossil fuel divestment campaign uh, was his proposal for a way to stigmatize fossil fuel companies and anyone associated with them, and thereby, uh, he said, break the American voter free of the chains of these corporate interests. Now, within weeks, Bill McKibben was on the road uh, with a national tour called Do the Math. One of his stops was in Philadelphia, where he met with some activists at Swarthmore College, which had already taken up his idea and had started the first fossil fuel divestment movement. And the meeting of McKibben with Swarthmore was the match in the oil barrel that set this movement on fire. And, um, the, and in his wake, it, at each stop in this national tour, he left behind uh, fossil fuel divestment campaigns. Uh, 
that movement, despite its claim of trying to uh, open up free speech for people who have uh, been shut out, it actually has no time for the niceties of academic freedom and free speech. It bullies dissenters, it ostracizes those who disagree, um, and it has polarized the campus and shamed students and professors who oppose fossil fuel divestment into silence. Um, these are often conservative students, but they're not always. There are a number of environmentalists uh, on the left who oppose divestment as ineffective. Uh, for instance, Stephen Cohen, the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia, Robert Stevens, the uh, lead author of three IPCC reports. All of these people, it stigmatizes and um, shames. Uh, one brief example of this occurred at Swarthmore College, where at a board meeting, uh, 200 activists hijacked the board meeting, walked in carrying signs that said, check your ignorance, and this is social responsibility, uh, took over the microphones, and when two students in the audience who opposed divestment, but also just simply opposed the takeover of the board meeting, um, dared to stand up and ask that the meeting return to order, the activists uh, uniformly clapped until the students' voices could not be heard, and then approached them and told them, you are free to leave. Uh, when this was over, uh, the president of the college, Rebecca Chop, uh, said yeah, it was important that she not interrupt the activists because of their academic freedom uh, to speak at this <coughs> meeting. So the fossil fuel divestment movement does not advance free speech. That is one of its false claims. Secondly, this movement claims to be the movement of a generation, but it proceeds by projecting an oversized image of itself. Now, it's important to realize that the divestment movement has succeeded in capturing the imaginations of a significant minority of American college students. That's what makes this movement dangerous. Nevertheless, it is important to remember that this is a minority. Um, let me give you a few numbers. There are more than a thousand divestment campaigns on college campuses. 30 American colleges and universities have decided to divest from at least some fossil fuels. These include Georgetown, Stanford, and the New School. 72% of Harvard undergraduates voted to support fossil <coughs> fuel divestment, although Harvard itself has not divested. Um, by our count in our study, there are more than 4,000 American college and university professors who have publicly supported fossil fuel divestment, either by voting for it in a faculty senate resolution, by signing a petition, and in some cases, professors have actually joined students at sit-ins for fossil fuel divestment. This past spring alone, there were 11 sit-ins on college campuses, including one at Swarthmore that lasted for 32 days. Uh, a number of professors joined that sit-in, including a biology professor who brought his class to the sit-in and had class in the hallway outside the president's office. So this movement has grown and has um, projected a large Im image of itself. Some of that is false, and it's important to keep <coughs> that in mind. Uh, this is a movement that is astroturf. It looks like grassroots when you first get a glimpse of it, but it's not really. This is not an organic upwelling of student angst about climate change. Uh, this is a seeded movement that has been planted by political demagogues. This is a movement with national hierarchies. 350.org, the organization founded by Bill McKibben, pays students to be activists. It sends them to summer trainings <coughs> with paid internships. Uh, this is a movement organized by outside agitators. Every single divestment campaign on campus that is associated with 350.org has a paid staff member that oversees its campaign and, and sets its activism schedule up to a year in advance. Um, and this is a movement that, while it is uh, very broad, is not very deep. Most of these campaigns are run by very small but very loud groups of activists who have learned political history. They have learned that a small group of um, very <laughs> agitated um, outsiders can uh, succeed as a faction by um, convincing the others that their cause is the one that needs to be supported. Um, this is also a movement that is well-funded. Uh, Tom Steyer, who is famous, of course, for uh, spending more than any other uh, on the last uh, 2014 election, is a major funder of 350.org. He is also on the board of trustees at Stanford, which has divested from coal. Um, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, um, Al Gore, the Schumann Media Center, these are all institutions that are uh, 
investing heavily into this movement and have made it possible. The third falsity that I'd like to present to you about this movement is uh, the claim that the movement aims to help the environment, that somehow by getting rid of stocks uh, of fossil fuel companies, this will improve the environment, uh, stop global warming, and uh, make everyone's world a better place. Uh, there are lots of economic reasons that that doesn't work. First of all, that when the stocks are sold, someone else buys them up. The activists, <laughs> the activists are aware of that, and they say their goal is not to bankrupt the fossil fuel industry financially, but to bankrupt the industry and anyone who dares to support fossil fuels um, socially and morally. But even if you look at the so-called success stories of this movement, they are not really successes. Uh, in our study, we examined every single divestment decision by an American college and university and looked closely at what that actually means. And in fact, only 34% of collegiate divestment decisions are complete. The other, about 70%, leave, uh, in most cases, the majority of fossil fuel investments in place. Uh, usually, uh, the colleges and universities um, divest the smallest amount possible to make the political <coughs> statement, but don't actually do anything at all. And we did a case study more closely of 13 institutions that collectively had invested uh, prior to their divestment decisions, about $34 million in fossil fuel companies, a tiny fraction of the total endowment. It was about 1% of their total endowment holdings. And after the divestment decision, about 50% of that, $17 million, had actually been moved out of the industry. The rest of it remained in place. And in fact, uh, there are some divested institutions that have actually not divested at all. We call these dinos, divestments in name only. <laughs> these are institutions that are getting all the headlines, all the political momentum that the movement wants, uh, but haven't actually done anything at all. Um, and there are some big names among these. For instance, Oxford University, which has become the go-to example of a success story in the divestment movement. Everyone wants to claim the prestige of Oxford University as being part of your movement. Um, this summer, Oxford announced that it would divest from direct investments from fossil fuel companies, uh, not touching any of its commingled funds or mutual funds. And in fact, um, when I emailed the finance director at Oxford University and asked about this, it came out that Oxford University has no direct investments in fossil fuels, and it did not have any prior to its divestment decision. Nothing has changed. Uh, the same thing happened at Syracuse University, at uh, Humboldt State University, and at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Uh, we also named four runner-up dinos that have done next to nothing. These include uh, Georgetown here in DC, which said it had divested an insubstantial portion of its direct investments in coal companies. Uh, Stanford's decision, much lauded by the press, is another runner-up dino, only direct investments in coal, which turns out to be almost nothing. Um, some have speculated that it is nothing at all, but we can't actually prove that. Um, and, and several other universities as well. So in light of this, um, the real goal of the movement is to politicize the university. It is to turn the university into a political tool to push President Obama and other politicians to become more radical in their environmental policies. Um, the advocates of this movement are aware that the Paris Climate Summit is coming up in December. Uh, they have openly said their goal is to get as many divestment decisions in the next few months to push for more radical action there. And and that is really the heart of, of the issue, uh, that universities are being politicized. They're being turned into a billboard for virtue signaling. And um, this is violating one of the most basic trusts of higher education, which is to provide a haven away from um, ideological battles and to provide a place where students can wrestle with hard ideas and search for the truth. Uh, and so in light of that, um, it's important that we push back against the divestment movement, not just for the sake of um, broader policies, but even just for the idea of academic freedom and the political neutrality of higher education. So uh, for that, I would encourage you to take a look at our report. Um, 
and I'll close there. Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody doing today? Good. All right, good to hear. Uh, I'm Brendan Williams with American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers. Uh, AFPM member companies make modern life possible. They make modern life better. Uh, oil, natural gas, and the products produced from them, including plastics and materials critical to everything from cell phones to construction materials, safety equipment, and medical devices, are truly the linchpin of modern civilization. These fossil fuels and their derived products have lifted millions out of poverty and led to longer, healthier lives for people across the globe. This reality highlights the short-sightedness of the divestment movement. Why should any shareholders want to sell stock in companies that have achieved so much good? And given this good, what's the divestment movement really about? I'll get into these points a little later, but I really want to start by highlighting the necessity of oil and gas uh, and the, the refining and petrochemical industry's positive impact for consumers and the U.S. economy domestically. I'll then speak about the necessity for fossil energy and petroleum products more globally. Here in the U.S., oil and natural gas are used as the feedstocks to make approximately 99 percent of U.S. petrochemicals. Uh, petrochemicals used in the production of everything from the roof to your house, to clothing, to medical devices, uh, to food and beverage packaging. Th this slide here uh, just gives a couple examples. I'm sure most of you probably have some of these are either wearing or have some of these products in your pocket, whether it's a credit card or a cell phone. Um, renewable energy, 15% of windmill blades are petrochemical products. The grease that spins the gears are petroleum derived. So renewable energy is even impossible without uh, petroleum products. 60% uh, of homes use natural gas for heating. My native state of New York uh, relies on oil and natural gas to heat 85% of its household. Uh, petroleum supplies 37.2% of energy used in the U.S., and Americans use about 19 million barrels of oil every day. This year, Americans are on track to consume more than 139 billion gallons of gasoline uh, and over 56 billion gallons of diesel fuel. These facts likely highlight why, when Columbia University considered divestment, it concluded it seems unlikely that it seems unlikely to us that divestment from fossil fuels would quote unquote revoke a social license when we continue to use fossil fuels day after day in every aspect of our lives. Uh, so in addition to all the consumer benefits, the ubiquity in consumer products I mentioned, the oil and gas industry is, is really an economic driver. Uh, for this country. Fuel and petrochemical manufacturers are direct financial drivers of the U.S. economy. The refining industry alone is responsible for 2.7 million direct and indirect jobs and contributes 8.5 billion annually to federal coffers. The sector is responsible for nearly 1.5 trillion in economic output, all <coughs> things considered. Now let's talk about who owns the oil and gas industry. Pension funds, IRAs, and individual investors hold over 65% of oil and gas company stocks. These are the retirement accounts for uh, individuals across the country. Uh, and then taking a look beyond our borders really paints an even brighter picture of the benefits and necessity of fossil fuels. Globally, the world gets about 81% of our energy from fossil fuels. And even in 2035, projections indicate fossil fuels will provide 79% of a much higher level of energy consumption. However, living in the developed world, we take for granted that a significant portion of the global population lives without basic amenities that make our lives longer, healthier, better. <coughs> 1.33 billion people globally are without access to electricity. 663 million people, one in 10, lack access to safe water. 2.6 billion people are without clean cooking facilities. 2.8 billion people rely on wood, crop waste, dung, and other biomass to cook and heat their homes of which about 3.5 million people each year die from indoor air pollution. Despite decades and billions of dollars in subsidies, renewable energy resources represent only 11% of global energy consumption. They cannot provide enough reliable energy for the world. As they have done with the developed world, fossil fuels are necessary to eradicate energy poverty and lead to better lives for millions of individuals across the globe. So in light of these facts, why the call for divestment? Advocates of divestment evoke the mantra of climate change. However, many of the statements from divestment advocates speak more directly to their true intentions. Um, building on the Bill McKibben theme, quote, the hope is that divestment is one way to weaken those companies, oil and gas companies, 
uh, financially, but even more politically. If institutions like colleges and churches turn them into pariahs, the two-decade chokehold on U.S. politics and, D politics and D.C. and other capitals will start to slip. So the goal is political shame. Why do this to companies that produce their products and generate something that, that leads to so much good and has really you know, created modern life? As, as my fellow panelist, Rochelle, stated recently, the organizer's goal is not to cause colleges to divest, but to anger students at the refusal of colleges to divest fully and turn their frustration into long-term antipathy toward the modern fossil fuel-based economy. Why? Ms. Peterson's colleague explains the ultimate beneficiaries are folks who have a lot of money invested in green energy. They want to drive up the costs of affordable energy so consumers are forced to pay for expensive energy in which to, to again, make the, you know, essentially act as a hedge on their green energy investments. Who pays for these costs? Initially, the institutions that divest themselves. Ultimately, the costs are unfortunately borne by our most vulnerable citizens. In relation to universities, uh, universities contemplating divestment, I urge them to take a look at a Caltech study featured on the website divestmentfacts.com. Some of my <coughs> friends in the upstream community have, have put up. The report highlights that Harvard would have faced nearly $108 million in losses if it divested, or a 16% loss over 50 years. The study notes other institu institutions would face similar losses. Such results are not surprising when you look at the financial results of fossil energy stock performance versus green energy performance. This graph attempts to recreate one Bjorn Lomborg, skeptical environmentalist, for many of you are familiar with him, uh, created an article public, published last year on divestment. It, it's kind of a poor recreation. I didn't have the rights to use his graph, so I made my own. Uh, but it compares the le leading global oil and gas index with the leading global energy index. Uh, you know, I'll leave it up to you where you'd rather have your money over the last several years. At the very least, divesting given these figures results in universities and other institutions violating their fiduciary duties. However, as mentioned earlier, the worst impacts are on our nation's poor. In a report last year, the Campaign for Home Energy Assistance noted that energy, costs increase in recent, energy cost increases in recent years have significantly reduced the purchasing power of the Low-Income ho low Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP. It's a federal program designed to ensure the poor can pay their energy bills. As the report notes, close to 80% of LIHEAP recipients using heating and cooling assistance are below 100% of the poverty level. <laughs> which would be 23850 a year for a family of four in fiscal year 2014 levels. More than 75% of all households receiving LIHEAP assistance have at least one member who is elderly, disabled, or a child. Policies that look to tarnish fossil fuels by discouraging their use, primarily to force more expensive energy resources, reduce the ability of critical safety nets like LIHEAP to save more people. In December, the New York Times, of all publications, revealed how such policies would have prevented expansion, such policies have prevented expansion of natural gas infrastructure in New England, uh, and they've disadvantaged other low, low income Northeast consumers. As the National Black Chamber of Commerce President Harry Elford wrote in a guest post on the AFPM blog, the Petro Primer, I encourage you to read it if you don't already, uh, economic improvement is impossible without access to the most basic modern amenity, electricity. Among its countless benefits are schools with lights, health clinics that function, and more opportunity. I believe the moral argument should be about providing access to affordable energy here at home and around the globe rather than discriminating against certain types of energy. So in conclusion, an honest look at the facts highlights how fossil fuels are necessary for modern life. They are necessary to protect our most vulnerable. Fossil fuel companies are developing and manufacturing our critical natural resources in an environmentally responsible manner that provides the most affordable energy and products necessary for bettering the human condition. Sending a signal through divestment that fossil fuels somehow work against the best interests of the world, as one university that divested uh, stated, uh, is the opposite of being socially responsible. It's immoral hypocrisy. And with that, those are my remarks. <laughs> Well, it's been quite some time since the problem of campus political correctness has been front page news, as it has been all this week. This week's events got me thinking back to 1987, 
when Alan Bloom's brilliant and challenging book, The Closing of the American Mind, stunned the country by shooting to the top of the bestseller list and kicking off a national debate about what had just been dubbed political correctness. Around that same time, Jesse Jackson joined Stanford students chanting, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go, after which Stanford University eliminated its required course in Western civilization. We've seen the fruit of that event this week as University of Missouri students, led by a leftist professor, chanted, hey, hey, ho, ho, journalists have got to go, while ejecting a student reporter from their midst. In the late 1980s, when Stanford and many other schools began eliminating their courses in Western civilization, we were assured that great works by the likes of John Milton and John Stuart Mill would still be welcome on campus. Well, today, even if such eminent defenders of classic liberalism are still taught in limited doses here and there, Milton, Mill, and their like have largely been ejected from the academy, not only their books, but their guiding spirit, which uh, once was the spirit of higher education. And the illiberal and anti-liberal multiculturalist mindset that inspired Jesse Jackson and those chanting students 28 years ago has metastasized and moved many steps closer to its totalitarian endpoint. Now, among my favorite pieces on the dust-ups this week at Yale and Missouri, uh, an article by the liberal writer, Jonathan Chait, stands out, not only for the perspicacity of its analysis, but for its title. Quote, can we start taking political correctness seriously now? End quote. <clears throat> Chait's piece explains that liberals are mistaken to dismiss the excesses of campus political correctness as the ordinary folly and spiritedness of youth. Political correctness, he explains, is a deep-lying campus culture, a culture nurtured and supported by neo-Marxist ideologues. That culture, says Chait, threatens to spread to American society as a whole, at which point its repressive consequences could be difficult to stop. Now, my main quarrel with Chait's piece is that title, Can We Start Taking Political Correctness Seriously Now? You see, that title is directed to Chait's fellow liberals. <coughs> Chait takes it for granted that conservatives already do take political correctness seriously. Well, I disagree. If you want a title for my talk today, it would be can conservatives start taking political correctness seriously now? Because I really don't think that conservatives have been taking campus political correctness seriously for at least the last decade or more. For a wide variety of reasons, conservatives, at least as much as liberals, tend to write off the madness of the leftist academy as so much nonsensical fluff unworthy of serious energy, resources, or attention, and useful only as a source of lurid entertainment. This is a serious mistake, easily one of the most important mistakes the conservative movement has made in recent times. It's why we're losing the culture, and it's why we're losing elections, especially at the presidential level. Now, the National Association of Scholars Divestment Report allows us to recognize and respond to the deeper cultural damage of the fossil fuel divestment movement, but only if that report is rightly understood. A quick glance at the report's executive summary might leave the impression that the divestment movement is nothing much to worry about. The size of the movement, while certainly growing, is said to be overstated. And of the very few colleges that have actually divested, fewer still have done so in anything like a thorough manner. More important, the report describes the fossil fuel divestment movement as knowingly unable to decrease the share price of fossil fuel companies or to appreciably shrink their profits or access to capital. So what is there to worry about? And sure enough, when conservatives learn about the fossil fuel divestment movement, they're quick to recognize um, exactly this point. <coughs> Economically speaking, divestment just won't work. Sell off your stocks in these profitable companies and someone else is going to snap them up at bargain rates. So divestors are only hurting themselves. And many conservatives then ask, after figuring this out, what is there to worry about? Well, 
there's plenty to worry about. You see, what Rochelle Peterson has done in this report is to expose the underlying strategy of the divestment movement's organizers, which is drawn directly from the Saul Alinsky-style community organizing that pervades the movement. Community organizers commonly press impossible demands on their foes in hopes of provoking refusal and ginning up the anger that strengthens and motivates the group. Organizers sometimes self-consciously lose the battle, but only to win the war. And what is that war? The real goal is to build a mass of outraged voters who aim to turn America's political and economic system on its head. Voters who believe the system is rigged and therefore illegitimate. Voters who believe their opponents have no valid arguments and thus no right to be heard. Voters who believe that fossil fuel companies are evil and must be phased out of business, but more importantly, voters who believe that the capitalist economic system that gives rise to those companies should someday be made every bit as obsolete as fossil fuel companies themselves. These are the real goals of the fossil fuel divestment movement, and they cannot be taken lightly. Far from being unreachable, to a remarkable extent, they are already being realized. The millennial generation, shaped by the divestment movement and the broader sustainability movement of which it is part, has already helped to push the Democratic Party far to the left and has helped as well to give rise to the first openly socialist presidential campaign with significant popular support in 100 years. And the divestment movement is part of a broader, illiberal turn in the millennial generation that now puts the very existence of American freedom of speech at risk. <clears throat> I know that Saul Alinsky-style community organizing and its neo-Marxist roots are powerful within the divestment movement because I wrote about this incident two years ago uh, that you heard Rochelle uh, describe, the Swarthmore incident, where advocates used a pre-arranged technique of gradually accelerating clapping in unison to clap down and silence their conservative student opponents. Uh, by the way, if you want to see the video of this, you can Google the piece I wrote a couple of years ago. It's you just Google my name and Swarthmore spinning out of control is the title of it. An amazing video. So I was quite struck to read about Rochelle Peterson's interview with one of the leaders of Swarthmore's divestment movement. Uh, because a year and a half after this incident, the student admitted that clapping down his fellow students had been a mistake. The technique, he said, had only been intended for use on Swarthmore's board of managers. <laughs> now, this is exactly what Jonathan Shait is talking about. The student who Rochelle Peterson interviewed was admitting, but then excusing his group's authoritarian excess as a case of spontaneous high spirits. In effect, he was saying, hey, we never actually planned to clap down those conservative students. It, we, just, we somehow lost control. It was all a big accident. Well, this is a lie. The ideology and practice of silencing opponents by clapping them down is itself illiberal and authoritarian. The fact that these divestment activists imprudently and without prior planning applied their uh, totalitarian techniques to their fellow students is not an anomaly, but only to be expected. Teach students to reject freedom of speech for the powerful, and you must expect them to cast it aside in short order for anyone who stands in their way. <clears throat> How then do we fight this menace? Most fundamentally, we must fight this illiberal movement by returning classical liberalism to our campuses, by striving to restore the ethos of liberal education of John Stuart Mill, and of the marketplace of ideas. I have some ideas about how we might go about this, but I don't have time to detail them right now. I hope to be writing about them shortly. But the fundamental point is that fighting the argument over the merits of fossil fuels is only part of what needs to be done. And ultimately, I believe, not even the most important part. Divestment as a strategy is profoundly at odds with the ethos of liberal education itself. It is not the business of a college or university 
to take stands on sharply debated national issues. This kind of institutional endorsement can only pressure both faculty and students into either silencing themselves or intimidating others. One of the most dismaying things we learned from the NAS divestment report is how relatively seldom opponents of divestment have recourse to this argument from the principles of liberal education. <clears throat> the divestment report also tells us that the Swarthmore Faculty Senate has formally endorsed fossil fuel divestment, as have several Swarthmore academic departments, as departments, endorsed the divestment movement. Now imagine the pressure on a student who does not hold with divestment, majoring in a department that has formally endorsed it. This may be a more profound violation of that student's intellectual freedom, even than being clapped down by a bunch of Alinskyite fanatics at a public meeting. The NAS report tells us that the leaders of Swarthmore's divestment movement attribute their activism to the lessons in an oppressive Western culture that they continually receive in their history and English courses. That is exactly right, and that is exactly the problem. Our colleges and universities truly have abandoned the ideals of classic liberalism as embodied in the practice and experience of liberal education and have turned themselves instead into political finishing schools. Better yet, our universities have returned to the origins of American higher education, which was divinity school education. Our colleges are now divinity schools for an illiberal, secular, political religion of the left. Participation in the divestment crusade is merely a means to that end, one of several obligatory sacraments in the new dispensation. Yes, there's something funny about this in both senses of that word, but even so, it isn't a joke. The fate of our society and our politics rests in the balance as we ponder how to respond to fossil fuel divestment and other such troubling movements. And that is why I ask whether conservatives are finally ready, after a hiatus of a decade or more, to take what is happening on our troubled college campuses seriously once again. I very much hope that we are. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the speakers very much for their uh, informed talks and also for staying to the schedule pretty well. So we have, we have time for questions. Do we have a um, microphone? Yes, OK. So are there questions in the audience? Yes, please. And, and remember to state who you are and any affiliation so that those watching online can get an idea. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Islam. I don't know. Yes, OK. Cool. Awesome. Uh, my name is Isaac Duarte. I'm with uh, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Um, so I know that the Tides Foundation funds uh, the divestment movement. I know they fund a lot of other anti-nuclear groups. Is the divestment movement also anti-nuclear? <coughs> I'm going to guess that's addressed to me. It is very strongly anti-nuclear. Um, it, it, it inherently favors alternative energy uh, sources of energy, especially solar and wind. But uh, really, its main goal is uh, demonizing fossil fuels. What it would replace it with is uh, it treats as a secondary concern, but um, it does not like nuclear energy either. <coughs> Very good. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jenny Thomas, and I have a question for all of you, really. Um, and Stanley started getting at the solutions, the leadership vacuum, both on campuses and perhaps in the movement and perhaps in the industry because of this battle of hearts and minds that are, that's being waged without adequate time and focus by those of us who have different points of view, what do we do? Um, where's the leadership vacuum and how do we fill it? What are the solutions? Well, go ahead. Please, no, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, I mean, I think, um, well, certainly this panel today is a, a good example of taking leadership on highlighting the fallacy of the divestment movement. Uh, we can all be leaders on this issue. Make your voice heard. Uh, in, in, in my opinion, the facts obviously <coughs> speak for themselves on you know, the, the benefits of you know, petroleum products to modern life and lifting millions of people out of poverty, making modern life better possible. Uh, and that's you know, something that's ignored from the debate because as I stated, as, as my fellow panelists have echoed, it's, it's 
you know, it's a politically driven movement with ulterior motors, it's, it motives. It's, it's not really even about divesting. Uh, so I think as, as long as people are highlighting the facts that, you know, and we can all do it individually, we can all be, be leaders on this if, you know, we, we simply have the in inclination to just speak up about it. Uh, well, before I address positive steps, I just, I can't resist giving one example that I think dramatically brings home the problem uh, that we've, we're facing, and this speaks directly to how intimidated students feel of resisting. This was in this morning's New York Times, literally this morning. It's a full-page ad for Dickinson College, which advertises an award which it gave to a famous uh, star, Mark Ruffalo, who opposes fracking, and it gave the award last year to Bill McKibben. It advertises all of its sustainability courses and its sustainability-themed curriculum. If you read this ad and you enter Dickinson College, how could you possibly dissent on any of these issues? From the start, the college has formally taken a stand. This is even worse, I think, than enrolling in divestment, is putting out an ad to the entire world, advertising yourself this way. And, and of course, this is a problem for the kind of um, issue we've seen in Missouri. You risk being called a racist or some sort of ist, whatever the issue is, sexist, racist, whatever, no matter what you oppose the left on at school. And so what's happened is, this, this, first of all, this speaks to the issue in the report uh, where, there are yes, there are a minority of students here, but they have the whip hand because everyone else is intim intimidated partly by the uh, endorsement, the uh, quasi-official endorsement of the college and partly by these fears of being um, attacked for being racist, sexist, bigoted, uh, under the uh, thumb of uh, the climate, uh, the uh, oil companies. I think the way to attack this, and I started getting at this at the uh, end of my talk, is through the theme of liberal education and through the theme of free speech. The left on campus doesn't like free speech, but it finds it difficult to openly oppose it. There's another wonderful series of reports that the National Association of <coughs> Scholars does. It's on something called common reading. This is now uh, a common practice at colleges. When you uh, enter a college the summer before you're asked to do a reading. Every, every freshman is asked to do a reading, which also functions as a kind of giant advertisement of what the college's values are. And if you see the NAS reports, these are thoroughly <coughs> politicized books that are given to them. Well, what if we started a movement, both on campus and off, asking for John Stuart Mill's On Liberty to become a common reading? It's classic, it's brilliant, it's accessible, it's short. Where are all the libertarian students on campus? We hear that the millennials have a healthy chunk of libertarians. What does that mean exactly? Does it just mean, get away from me, I want to do whatever I want to do? Or are these people committed to the idea of liberty? What would happen if we give them this way to express their feelings? Will the colleges openly repudiate uh, the classic liberal values of John Stuart Mill? I wonder about that. So I think this is, this is a way uh, that would not get the kids caught under these threats of intimidation uh, and, and that everyone could get behind. A liberal like Jonathan Shait could get behind it. A libertarian could get behind it. And a lot of what conservatives do nowadays is to conserve classic liberalism. <clears throat> That's what con real conservatism has become in great part an effort to conserve classic liberalism. So everyone should be able to get behind this except for the illiberal left. So that's one sort of movement I think we should try to start on campus, but it won't work if we can't connect with the actual students. I would... Oh, oh sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I would give a charge to two groups. Uh, first, to the students. This is a movement that advances by projecting itself as the unified consensus of a generation. And... Um, Mostly that's true, or mostly that's false, but there is a grain of truth to that in that um, this movement has pushed the new normal further and further left. So while a majority of students do not themselves participate in divestment campaigns, when it comes to a vote, they do vote for it, 72% of Harvard students. That is a number that is very common at other universities that have had votes on this. Um, the divestment movement has not been able to prompt 
belief that divestment is the way to go, but it's been able to prompt conformity. So the students who oppose divestment or even just have doubts about them uh, should be emboldened to speak up. And uh, I think they'll find that they are not alone. Also, I would lay some blame to the trustees. It's true that <coughs> the vast majority of American colleges and universities have not divested. It's only about uh, half of 1% of the universities in the US, but even the institutions that haven't divested, the, um, the trustees are not uh, enforcing order or upholding academic freedom. Uh, Harvard has twice declined to divest, but the Harvard students have held three sit-ins, including one that um, blocked all the entrances to campus for, uh, for a morning. And, um, and there was very little response to that. So the trustees, while they're, they're doing a, a pretty good job holding the line from not divesting, are really failing to enforce order and protect the freedom of the students who oppose divestment. Mm -hmm. yeah, one in the back. Hi, my name is Jared Moore. Um, I'm building a technology and policy consulting company. And uh, my first project was actually on deep decarbonization. And uh, this was funded by Sam Thernstrom of the Energy Innovation Reform Project. And so what drives me crazy about the uh, divestment movement is the assumption that fossil fuels are inherently carbon emitting. You can compress the CO2, you can put it underground. We have experience doing this. And actually, my first research project I presented at the National Coal Council meeting last week showing that under deep decarbonization, fossil fuels are actually more competitive than renewables, even if you assume the levelized cost of electricity is more expensive. So my question is, um, when you guys have talked to people, do they even know that fossil fuels can be, you know, low carbon? Uh, and do they know that it's probably something we need to practice, especially if we ever want to get to 350 parts per million? You know, we need to practice getting CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it underground. That probably starts with doing it with fossil fuels from anthropogenic <laughs> sources. So what are, what are the conversations you guys have been having? Thank you. Having interviewed uh, several dozen students for this report, I would say none of them know that. And if they were told that, um, they would laugh and they would think that uh, a climate denier had made that up. <laughs> Unfortunately, that, that's what I think they would think. But the leaders of the fossil fuel movement do understand that there are people out there who recommend geoengineering and other technological fixes to the problem and that they don't like that, they're afraid of that. Bill McKibben himself, I, 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 I'm not 100% sure of this, but I believe I'm recalling this correctly, Bill McKibben himself initially was in favor of fracking when the thing first came out because he said, well, this is obviously gonna you know, leave off less carbon. He had, to, he had to find a way to go do a 180 on that. They are really afraid of that kind of solution because if you read into Bill McKibben's own writings and the other people in the movement, they have a vision of, of a whole new kind of world, which is essentially a repudiation of the modern world. I mean, we heard that the modern world effectively depends on fossil fuels. Well, they know that. And what they don't say so much out loud, but if you read their work in depth, you can see they actually want us to go back to a quasi-village kind of situation where we're farming locally, where suburbanites are farming on their, on their front lawns and, and things like that. So they don't want a technological solution. Yeah, they all read Candide in college. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would just echo, there's just a lot of misinformation about fossil fuel energy and um, emissions across the board. And, and again, I, the divestment movement, I'll just echo my fellow panelists, it's not really about, you know, climate change or what they say it's about. You know, you've had a lot of these NGOs that, as, you know, as, as my, my fellow panelists just pointed out, used to be in favor of natural gas, and now it turns out that, you know, without any massive government mandate, we combine technology and innovation to lead to a, a tremendous growth in natural gas production in this country. And if we're talking about carbon, we're at mid-90s levels now. Uh, but you have all these same activists who are opposed to natural gas use. So, you know, it speaks to, again, the questions raised through this panel. What are the true intentions? Yes, uh, Stephen, uh, uh, Stephen Thomas, Yelverton. Uh, Dr. Kurtz, I'd like to agree with you. Just, I just happened last night to go to a climate change seminar. And they were very candid. The, the problem is science and technology. And they were advocating living like American Indians and being in harmony with nature. 
<laughs> yes, that's right. And I think I think this does amount to a kind of a very serious one. And I've actually written some pieces in some for the National Association of Scholars on how this amounts to a kind of secular religion. That's why, even though I think it's true that there's some astroturfing going on here that you've got, you know, it's hard to create a movement. You can pour money into something, and if there isn't a responsiveness out there in the culture, it's not going to happen. Th these kids are responding because they're, they're uh, losing something. Uh, and right now, millennials, uh, basically, it takes them a while to get married and start a family. Years and years and years, they're running around as sort of isolated individuals. They want something to believe in, some movement to be part of. Traditional religion doesn't suit them when they're, they're bumping around without a, a family in life. And this is what they have hit upon. This is what speaks to people. This is tied up with the increasing secularization, I think, of our society. You look at these activists, they're the ones who are secularizing and they're the ones who are supporting Bernie Sanders. So while this is being ginned up, there's something deeply real about it at the same time. Yes. Oh, sorry. We'll get to you. Ann Neal, American Council of Trustees and Alumni, at the risk of making a statement rather than asking a question, wanted to follow up a little bit on the trustee issue. In fact, they are responsible for their institutions, and we should be directing attention to them. And in fact, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni has done so. We have written to 1,100 boards. We have asked them to speak up on this issue in the face of political correctness. We have asked them to adopt a statement of academic freedom uh, returning to first principles. And we are starting to see boards do that. We've seen Purdue, we've seen American University faculty, Chicago, Princeton, and others. And so definitely we do agree and alumni in this audience should feel free to be writing to the presidents and the trustees at their institutions urging them to adopt such a statement. We also have a report called Free to Teach, Free to Learn, which talks about the Calvin Report issued by the University of Chicago some time ago. And this, again, is something that we're urging trustees to take a serious look at and adopt on their own campuses. Stanley, to your point, uh, the issue of institutional neutrality is important so that the individuals on college campuses have the right to free speech and uh, free exchange of ideas. And uh, this is, again, a statement that trustees would be well um, advised to take a look at, and we are urging them to do that. Boy, I want to echo and endorse that. The, Ca the Calvin Report is, is the solution to this. If every college adopted the University of Chicago's Calvin Report, which says basically universities should butt out of divestment and similar t uh, issues. This was during the, uh, the uh, Vietnam era that that was created. This would be a solution, and I'm delighted to hear that ACTA is pressing trustees not just to re reject divestment, which they're going to do for economic reasons anyway, but to reject it for the right reasons. I was disturbed to read, but not surprised, in the divestment report that, um, I can't remember the exact quote, but the Swarthmore, uh, the Swarthmore uh, trustees were saying that, um, well, uh, if, if, if if some practical things were a little bit differently, if it wasn't economically a problem, you know, then this would be a really tough decision for us. You know, so they, they weren't anywhere near the right justification. So the fact that ACTA is trying to get trustees to reject this, but for the right reasons, is, is wonderful, wonderful news. Yes, that is the solution. And, and that can link in to a campaign to bring you know, liberal writings back to the campus. Liberal, classic liberalism is the solution. That will embarrass them. That will make it hard for them to dispute you. Got to, literally, we have to get a movement for classical liberalism going. Building on the, building on the solutions point, um, you know, I recommend anyone challenge divestment, act, active, divestment activists to divest their lives from fossil fuels for a day yes. and yeah. see, see how far they get. <laughs> <laughs> Food I, for thought. I'd like to put on that line, put in a plug for a blog post I wrote with a, uh, an intern from Hope College, Alex Bellica, last spring, uh, what Harvard students pushing fossil fuel divestment are missing, and it's a sort of tongue-in-cheek, but not, not quite up to the onion level. Um, where we, we suggest a local learning movement, that the people at Harvard should probably find a university closer to their home so that they wouldn't burn all the fuel. <laughs> and uh, actually did serious calculations, good estimates of how many you know, uh, barrels of petroleum it would save and so on. But another point. The, the, not only the hypocrisy, which we highlight, but the selfishness of this. They're not, it's not costing these students anything. They're damaging the endowment that will provide education for the students that follow them. 
So it's like a zero cost uh, effort, uh, has zero impact on climate, and they're playing musical shares with the stocks, you know, shifting them from one company to another. Um, so that, that's, that was the sort of the hypocrisy and silliness of it. We have, we have somebody's been holding off for a while here. <laughs> uh, Connor Prosco with Freedom Capital, we're the uh, anti divestment investment firm. Uh, so we do the musical shares. Uh, one of the, uh, not to end on a, on, a, on a down note, but when you see this growing in the, in the universities, uh, what do you think, and I think this goes to anyone that would like to answer it, is the most dangerous next step in this movement, whether it be regulations, whether it be uh, pension funds that are also divesting and being enforced into this, or uh, growing just in the financial markets into a more mainstream thing? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, obviously, I think the goal here is, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, government regulations that acts as basically hedges against investments that right now aren't that economical. Uh, and I think, you know, it's the more attention <coughs> groups like yours and others uh, pay to this issue, the more they highlight the hypocrisy, highlight the fallacy of it, the more people will realize the, you know, lack of seriousness behind the divestment movement. And so I think that's, you know, events like this, uh, keeping, you know, blog posts like David mentioned, uh, you know, just really highlighting the facts is the best thing that, uh, that anyone can do um, in, in to combat any potential you know, regulatory scheme that looks to use the divestment uh, movement as its, its intellectual foundation. Well, uh, again, uh, you know, I'm worried about the political implications, which, as I tried to state in my uh, talk, we're, we're really experiencing every day. Uh, I mean, Obama, okay, the Canadian election made it easy for Obama to finally nix uh, Keystone, but that was still a sign that he was turning against the labor wing of the party <laughs> and going with these students. It's very so. By the way, do people even know that uh, President Obama has endorsed divestment? He did this in a kind of coded form. But he did it. He made this statement, how should you go out there and fight global warming? Invest, divest, then he threw in a couple other words. Just that little throw in, divest, was enough to make all of the divestment activists say he's on our side. And yet the press, for the most part, missed it. Conservatives missed a chance to, I think, really <laughs> make some legitimate criticisms of President Obama for throwing in with a movement which was dedicated to destroying you know, the core industry of America. And yet we've ignored that. So, and, I, and when I go, what Rochelle was saying, I think is right, that uh, there are a lot of silenced and intimidated kids, but they still don't have the guts or the intellectual wherewithal to vote differently when divestment comes up to a vote. So how are they going to vote in a general election campaign on, on political issues? So they are living in a hermetically sealed world. And there is a serious problem here. We have to try to break through to them. Yeah, we can use the internet and various other things. We have to have some kind of campus-based campaign. It isn't enough for us to just sit here and have forums because it's not going to break through to this world when you've got the university actually running ads, advertising itself. How is a student going to going to stand up to that. So this is a very serious problem. We have to start putting resources. The Republican donor class has to start paying attention to this. They tend to ignore this sort of thing and only go in for uh, politics. And might I say, again, a la Jonathan Shait, true liberals, genuine classic liberals who are Democrats but who believe in, um, in the principles of liber liberalism ought to be concerned about it too. I'll go Stanley on that. I, I think uh, the generation of students coming out of college right now are being turned into single-issue climate voters, and uh, even if they weren't, they're at they're at the very least being trained to think that smearing your opponents, uh, throwing a fit, and having a sit-in and obstructing normal life is the appropriate way to respond when you have a disagreement with someone. That's inherently anti-American. That is inherently opposed to principles of self-government and republican democracy. And if those are the voters that we have coming up to be our next generation of leaders, um, keeping our republic, as Ben Franklin said, is not looking so likely. I can't see around the post. No? OK. Any other questions? Yes. OK, here we go. <coughs> Hello, my 
my name is Claire Marie. I'm from the Charles Koch Institute, and I was wondering if um, maybe Rochelle or Stanley or Brendan can talk a little bit about um, how the rise of college attendance among people is maybe contributing to like the, politiz the politicization of the university. <coughs> As in the rising number of people going to college? Yeah, well, one consequence of uh, the of opening the floodgates to uh, more and more numbers of students is that college standards have declined. And um, college, for most students, is not a hard place anymore. Uh, the core curriculum has dissolved into distribution requirements or into nothing at all. The rigor of classes has plummeted. And when I interviewed students who were active in the divestment campaign, one of the most commonly recurring reasons that they gave for being involved in the campaign was that they wanted to do something hard. They wanted to do something. They wanted to do something that was really difficult, that made a difference, that had real-world influence, and that gave them a challenge. And the truth is, college for most students is not providing that anymore, and they're looking for that somewhere else. And for many of them, activism is where they find it. Well, there are lots of challenging opportunities in the oil and gas industry. <laughs> <laughs> In case you know any of that, we have a workforce website that tells you a lot about it. Uh, I want to bring in the uh, K through 12 issue in answer to your question. Uh, you're absolutely right that at the, the, on the college level, uh, basically ever since World War II, we've had an ever-expanding uh, cohort of uh, young Americans go to college. And just by having that, you get them going to these what really, I'm sorry to say, have become almost literally Democratic Party ideological training institutions. But now, uh, another battle I've been involved in the, over the AP uh, system, you've got the college board had this program, which used to be just a tiny sliver of students would take advanced placement tests. Now, uh, through, through government subsidies, uh, the college board, which enjoys a de facto monopoly uh, on advanced placement testing, has got about one-third of all American students taking advanced placement courses, and they're trying to get that up toward 40 and 50. Some districts are actually op automatically opting every student into AP classes, and only the parents can have to go to opt them out. And at the same time, the College Board is issuing now long curricula, which it never did in the past, for its AP classes, which essentially forces them to be taught from the left. I don't have to tell you or maybe I do, how the environment is being injected into American history in a way that is totally biased toward a particular point of view. There's even an environmental sciences AP class, which I think, although it's going to be much smaller enrollment than AP US history, probably a lot of these young high school kids who get inspired by these movements are going to take that environmental science course and become the leading cohort. So when you've got most young Americans going to college, and now you've got the AP program, whose leftist curricula are written by the leftist professors who control the schools. You're really talking about a complete intellectual monopoly. And what I've been trying to say here is basically conservatives had better wake up and start paying more attention to the culture. Because this is why we have been in some trouble politically, conservatives, is that you know, it, it, I think a lot of conservatives, especially the people who, who uh, do well and become donors or whatever, um, they go through school laughing and ignoring, uh, laughing at and ignoring all these crazy leftist professors. So they're predisposed to think that it's, uh, it's meaningless. This was their survival strategy. But if you can produce a quarter to a third of deeply committed students, and they have means of intimidating everyone else, you have got the culture. The 1960s, the best we can figure out, because there are no perfect surveys, maybe only about a third of the uh, baby boomers were really active as hippies or SDSers or really at the core of the 60s. And that's meaningful in, in two sentences. First, that's why we weren't entirely captured by the 60s ethos. That's why we did still have divisions. It was only a third. But look what only a third has done to change American culture. You can do a lot with one-third of any cohort population, especially if there's no ability for strong opposition. This is what conservatives have been ignoring, trying not to think about, and what they have to start acting differently on. They have to focus on the culture, broad scale, everything from Hollywood to the media uh, to education, because we're losing the next generation. 
Well, thank you. All good things must end, and our time has come up short here. Uh, thank you for your good questions, for attending, and uh, thank the panel very much. I thought it was a great <laughs>